The Old Testament lesson for this 16th Sunday after Trinity is recorded in the book of 1 Kings. It's the 17th chapter, begins with the 17th verse. If you remember from last week, we left off with Elijah visiting this widow and her son, and she being fed uh, miraculously, the whole household being fed with an unending supply of flour and oil. God worked this great miracle, and yet Pay attention here. When does she finally realize that Elijah's God is the true God? It's only after her son is raised from the dead. She has no problem blaming God when her son dies, but she doesn't recognize the compassion of God until after the resurrection. So, let's pay attention to this. Now, after this, okay, that is the miraculous feeding of of the household. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You've come to me to bring my sin to remembrance, to cause the death of my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged, and he laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, Have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. And this is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is recorded in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. It's the third chapter we pick up at the 13th verse. And Paul writes, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or even think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of Luke, the seventh chapter, beginning at the eleventh verse. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they all glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the gospel of your Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, it's clear from this morning's appointed text that today's theme revolves around suffering. Even if you've never had to grieve the loss of a loved one, we can all relate to suffering. I mean, these past several months haven't exactly been a vacation, right? We all suffer. Can your faith be shaken during these trying times? Absolutely. In fact, it can be very difficult to believe in the power and compassion and love of God when you've been brought so very low, when you're feeling the weight of the cross that you've been given to bear. 
And that's when we cry out, why God? You know, what have I done to deserve this? I'm reminded of an article I read a while back about an inscription that was recently discovered in one of the infamous Nazi concentration camps of World War II. Some poor Jew had carved into the wall of their cell, and I quote, If there is a God, he will have to ask for my forgiveness. I don't think any of us has ever felt that low, but no one can deny that we haven't at least doubted or questioned the wisdom of God at times. No one here can deny that we haven't felt at least a little undeserving of the misery that we've been made to endure, especially during these past several months. No one can deny that we haven't, especially during these last months, no one can deny that we haven't at least looked to God during this trying time and wondered why we're being punished. Let's go back to the text. Why did Jesus raise the widow's son? Well, Luke answers that question very plainly. Answer, because he had compassion on her. Now understand, to say that he had compassion on her, that doesn't mean that he merely felt sorry for her. No, okay? he loved her. Her pain, the Greek word there, splagnizomai. Okay? Her pain splagnizomai him. That means it, it tore his insides up. To splagnizomai is a, a very visceral, heart-rending feeling. His divine compassion, his love, uh, it couldn't help but act. Jesus, okay, God's love and compassion in the flesh, if you're willing to, to see this, Jesus reaches out and stops this somber funeral procession. The Lord of life then reaches out and touches the unclean. I mean, he does the unthinkable. He touches the unclean. He touches the dead, all out of his great compassion and love. All right, no mask, no social distancing restrictions, no fear. This is love in action. He reaches out and he shows not just the mom, but everyone else who's present. He shows everyone who's in charge. Death does not have the final say. Right? I am the resurrection and the life. Yeah, that's what's going on here. Luke tells us that the resurrection of this young man then caused the whole crowd to erupt in praise and thanksgiving. They feared and glorified God as a result of this mighty sign and wonder. They say, a great prophet has arisen among us. God has now visited his people. And this report, just as Luke says, this report spread all throughout the surrounding region. Okay, that means everyone was hearing about the Lord of life and his compassion. And it was all because of a funeral. I want you to think about that. I mean, we're still hearing about this today. Some 20 centuries later, 28 centuries later, if you want to include Elijah and that widow and the resurrection of her son, like we hear in the Old Testament lesson, 20 centuries later, 28 centuries later, we're still hearing about the divine compassion and almighty power of the Lord of life makes me wonder. You know, I mean, we don't know the names of either of these ladies. We don't know the names of their sons who died and who were resurrected. They're all anonymous. Their names are all forgotten to history, but the suffering is not. This is what makes me wonder. Would you be willing, would you be willing to endure suffering and anonymity if it meant that others would be brought to faith or others would be strengthened in their faith and they would come to praise God all as a result of your suffering. And then I'd say, be careful before you answer, because you know, the fruits that we already bear may be contradicting our confession. Ask yourself, does God work all things for the good of those who love him? Absolutely. Scripture doesn't lie, right? Okay. So does God work all things for good, for, uh, the good of those who love him, even when it comes to death, even when, you know, in the case of funerals? Is God working good even through cancer or divorce or depression or chronic pain or illness, job loss, imprisonment? I mean, look at what's going on today. God works all things, huh, for good through pandemics, insurrection, crooked politics, natural disaster. God is working these things for our good. The answer is yes. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole, you know, God is not the cause of evil, but God does permit evil. 
There's simply not enough time in the day to get into all this. Besides this, I know that you already know all this. But, you know, maybe that's the whole point. Maybe that's the problem. We do know the truth of God's love and compassion, and yet how often we forget. How often we we hit a couple bumps in the road. You know, we get knocked out of comfy cruise control, and then we lament. We question and doubt as as if God's made a mistake. You know, maybe God's fallen asleep at the wheel or lost track of us. Or, or worse yet, we hit these bumps in the road and we begin to question God, question his love for us. You know, he had such compassion on the widow, compassion, so much compassion that he had to act, right? Splagnizma, he had that compassion for her and he had to act. Well, why doesn't he show the same compassion to us? Why doesn't God act for us? It's not fair. Do something, God. And it's easy to praise God's compassion and mercy when things are going great in life. It's easy to do it from the, you know, the sterility of, of Sunday morning. It's quite another thing, though, to, to give thanks to God for all his mercy, all his grace, all his undeserved benefits, while you're still feeling the weight of the cross that you're bearing at that particular moment. Now, that's the thing, guys. I don't know what particular struggles you're dealing with right now. I don't know... Uh, I do know that we all have them. We're all suffering to one degree or another. That's part of living in a fallen and sinful world. We're all suffering. And we're not going to go and compare scars now either. I, I only say this because somebody's always quick to point out how, how their suffering is so much worse than everybody else. No one could possibly relate to them. You know, Even Job himself would thank God that he wasn't in their shoes. We're not going to do that. Maybe your sufferings aren't as bad as others. Praise God. Maybe things are even going great for you. You know, maybe you don't have a worry in the world right now. Hey, praise God. Then again, maybe you've never felt worse. Maybe you've never felt more forsaken or or, or all alone. Maybe you really are giving Job a run for his money. Praise God. Look. Whatever your situation may be, your reality, your truth before God, no matter what, it's the same. So whether you're up, whether you're down, richer, poor, sickness, health, fear of sickness, maybe you're in the greatest of health. Whatever the case may be, guys, you are a sinner who needs saving. Apart from Christ, you, O child of Adam, apart from Christ, you're dead in your sin, no matter what. But because of Christ you are redeemed. Because of Christ, in Christ, you have been saved. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say this all out of love. Look up from your belly button, man. Stop navel-gazing. Look up from your own personal pity party. Look to and focus on the cross of Christ. Here is the compassion of Almighty God, and it's on full display for all the world to see. Right? God so loved the world that we could say God had so much compassion on this fallen and sinful and evil world that he sent his only begotten son to trade places with us, to take our place in death so that we could have everlasting life with him in heaven. And I'll be the first to confess, it's sad that it often takes something tragic to wake me up, to get my attention, to get me lined out and turned around and focused back on Christ. It's incredibly sad that we, we often don't recognize or acknowledge God's compassion and mercy until after the tragedy has struck. And even then, I mean, let's be honest, do we truly recognize God's compassion and mercy or are we too busy blaming God for the tragedy? Do we recognize the compassionate love and mercy of God when our prayers and desires aren't being answered? You know, when our desires aren't being met the way we want them to be? Folks, again, let's focus back on God. Here is God's love and compassion, right here, right now, always. See, God didn't wait for you to cry out to him before he did something about your sinful condition. No, God took the initiative. While we were still yet dead in our sin, Christ died and rose again for us. His great compassion, his divine love for us, it led him to the cross to suffer our justly deserved punishment, to suffer our death, long before we even knew there was anything wrong. 
And you know what? This divine compassion continues today. I need to stress that. The divine compassion of our Lord, it's not a one and done type of thing that, that happened one Friday a long time ago in a distant land far, far away. No. God's loving compassion still reaches out to you today. His gentle touch reaches out and calms and halts the chaos that we call life. This funeral possession that we call life, it calms and halts it. And, and I will remind you, it reaches God reaches out and touches this. He stills it. No mask, no social distancing fears, no. Our Lord reaches out and gently steal, stills us. He assures us. He dries our tears. This is why he calls us to Sabbath, to rest. This is why we rest, so that the divine can serve us and comfort us and nourish us and heal us. It's finished, right? In Christ and because of Christ. Folks, be at peace. I know that's easier said than done, but your Lord can work these wonderful miracles. He does, right? He raised people from the dead. This is small potatoes, I would think. Be at peace. No matter how bad things may seem, by virtue of your baptism into Christ's death and resurrection, you belong to him. Nothing and no one can ever take that away from you. We have his promise. The gates of hell will not prevail. So that means neither will pandemics or elections or angry mobs or, or cancer, or depression, dysfunction, or anything else, even death itself. Nothing can steal this away from us, guys. You know, look, we grieve. I get it. We live in this fallen and sinful world. We grieve. We suffer. But we grieve and suffer in faith, don't we? We, we don't grieve and suffer like those who have no hope. Folks, I, I point you to the altar in your midst, to the font. Here is Christ. In the midst of all the suffering and chaos that's happening right now, whether it's in your personal life or in the nation or in the world, in the midst of all this chaos and suffering, here is the compassion of God. And he bids you to come to him. And, and I quote, take and eat, take and drink. This is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sin. Folks, you're not going to get this anywhere else in all of Greenwood today. God has visited his people, right? Well, God still visits his people. Here he is. The Lord of life continues to reign and rule in your very presence. Here is your joy. Here is your reason to rejoice, even in the midst of your suffering. So may this good news, okay, this truth of God's unconditional compassion and mercy and peace, may this truth be witnessed in all that you say and do. May your report of this great and undeserved compassion, may it reach out and go out to all those whom God brings you into contact with today. May the ever-present reality of God's compassion and love for you, may this compassion and love, may it guard you and keep you in the one true faith, now and into life everlasting. Amen.